All right, guys, so this is part two of uh, the review. I'm going to try and go a little faster here because there's quite a bit cover. So, um, but again, if you want an in-depth review of these subjects, please just watch my videos again. Um, specifically, today I am covering, um, what video, what am I doing? I am covering, um, if we look at all my videos, so today I'm going to be covering synthesizers and synthesis. So um, that is, man, where is that? That was near the beginning. Um, well, you can find it. Oh, right here. Lesson two, synthesizers and synthesis. And there are two parts to that, part one and part two. Um, and then I'm also covering today, oh, there's part three too. I'm sorry. There are three parts to synthesizers and synthesis. Um, granular synthesis is not covered on this test. Uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, what else? Buses and sends and aux channels is being covered. And then the last one I'm going to cover is the various audio effects plugins or plugin effects. Those are the three left um, for this final exam, I think. Yes, because I've done two. So let's talk about these then. Um, <clears throat> get started on synthesizers and synthesis. So um, synthesis, sound synthesis, again, is the act of creating a sound from scratch using electronic hardware or software instruments, right? Synthesis is sound is commonly used to do two things, um, to generate sounds unique to electronics or to recreate or model a sound of a real world acoustic instrument. Um, <clears throat> and, um, yeah, um, an electronic instrument, a synthesizer is an electronic instrument designed to generate audio signals. Uh, the types of synthesizers, additive synthesis is um, one of the most common, right? The idea that we just add several sounds together. Subtractive synthesis, which is the idea of taking a fairly broad spectrum sound and um, changing its sound by filtering out usually certain frequencies. Um, FM synthesis, which I got, I didn't ever got into this class, but um, it's frequency modulation is a very common technique for uh, doing music and sound. And then the last one is wavetable synthesis, which I covered a little bit as well. So those are the four most important types. This could be a question, right? What are the four types of synthesizers or the most common types of synthesizers? Because there are more. Um, <clears throat> So additive synthesis is the process of creating a synthesizer by combining many simple waveforms together to create a more complex sound or wave, right? Subtractive synthesis, a synthesis method where the quality of a sound is altered by removing frequencies of a sound source through filtering. FM synthesis, called frequency, frequency modulation synthesis, is achieved by taking the frequency of a wave, the carrier, and, and modulating it with a second waveform called the modulator. Um, the frequency of the carrier wave is modified by the amplitude and frequency of the modulator. Um, the last one, wavetable synthesis, is a synthesizer that creates sound by cycling through a table of oscillators. Um, and I showed you an example of this in Serum, and Ableton has one as well. There is no wavetable synthesizer in Logic yet, but I guarantee you it's coming. Um, the um, so those are the four most important or most common types of synthesizers. Wavetable again is a newer type of synthesizer. Um, it's only been around about seven or eight years or so. Um, and synthesizers like Serum and Massive um, are really great for wavetable synthesis. Um, the so the next most important thing here is the three principal components of every synthesizer. Okay, and uh, this is a really good. Good thing to know, of course. Um, the first one is the sound sources, the actual oscillators themselves. The second is the filters, right? The, um, the How we change the sound with filtering. And the third is the amp envelope or the main output, right? And we talked a lot, I showed many examples of this. So for instance, in RetroSynth, which is one of our simplest synthesizers, we have the oscillators here and they're called oscillator. The filter is here. <laughs> The amp is here, but the amp envelope you can see is actually down here, right? <clears throat> so, um, and then there's other things too. There's another filter envelope. This is the modulation envelope and then some other parameters, okay? <clears throat> so, and yeah, so I, that's what I did with these. I 
pointed them all out. So the oscillators, the filter, and the amp envelope. Here is ES1, I believe, um, in Logic. Um, and we have, again, the oscillators here, the filter in the center, and the amp envelope. Um, here is ES2, which also, again, oscillators, the three oscillators in here, the filtering in the center, and then the amp envelope and output here, okay? Um, and then once again, here is alchemy in logic. We have the oscillators here, which they're called sources in alchemy. We have the filter, and then we have the master out envelope. Okay. And uh, did I do another? Wow, another one. Here's serum, oscillator A and B, and then the filter, and then the envelope here for the main outputs. Okay. So sound source oscillators, they, they come in many forms. Sometimes they're complex, sometimes they're simple. Um, but they're um, often decided based on shape. So we can do, choose square waves. Here we can choose a square wave or a sawtooth type wave. Um, we can choose noise. Um, and then oscillator B here has some different settings. This is ES2. It has three oscillators, right? Um, so, and then I can tune them as well with this. Okay. So the, the sound source oscillators most commonly have these four parameters involved with them. The oscillators themselves, the oscillator level, how loud they are, or the mix of them, the oscillator tuning, and the oscillator panning, okay? Um, and again, you know, there's only 30 or 50 questions on this test, so most commonly my question is going to be like, what are the main parts of a synthesizer, right? This is pretty in-depth, um, but I'm just going to cover all this really quickly. So. And then the sound sources here um, themselves, here we have four oscillators. Um, and it's just another example of the sound sources. This is alchemy, of course. And we have four sources here. And we can choose from these pull down menus what type of oscillator we want. Um, if I go over here actually to logic and pull up alchemy in advance, you can see here's A. If I turn A and B on, I can turn B to a different source, a pulse wave, right? I can turn it into uh, whatever. I could go to complex sounds and pull up something. Um, so there's all sorts of different things. And then the mix here is determined actually by the volume amount for these on in alchemy, OK? So um, yeah, let's go on to the next one. So synthesizers part two, here I got into talking about filtering, right? And I talked about the different types of filters. So let me just briefly say again, what, what really matters about these oscillators is that you know this, right? You know that there are three types of oscillators. There are three principal components of the oscillator, the sound sources, the filters, and the amp envelope. You also know the types of synthesizers there are, right? Additive, subtractive, A FM, and wavetable synthesizers, what each of those are. Th that's the most important stuff to know for this final exam, okay? Um, in terms of this, what, what I just covered. Um, so let's go on here to the next part. <clears throat> Filtering. Um, filters, again, are usually the second stage of a synthesizer, right? They um, change the sound after the the initial input. So filters, um, they do lots of things, mostly uh, take away or enhance certain frequencies that have been, you know, put together in the in the oscillation area. So the most important parameters here in filtering, and these all matter, this could be on your test, is the filter type, right? Whether it's a low pass filter, a high pass filter, or a band pass filter. The filter cutoff frequency, which in this case is, is written right here on e, this is a al, um, retro synth. You can see it there. The filter cutoff slope, which is how steep this little line is, how quickly the sound is cutting off or whether it's a gentle cutoff. The resonance, we talked about these resonance before and I'll go over this briefly. And then the last one is the filter drive, the overall boost of the signal after filtering. So if I go into uh, logic, let me just add a, Retro synth here. <clears throat> so let's take a look at these. Oh, yes, create. So if I pull up a retro synth. So first of all, the fre frequency cutoff here is here. 
And interestingly, in alchemy or in uh, retrosynth, and this is common with some synth synths, you don't get a frequency. Instead, you get a, a value between zero and one, right? So uh, basically, fifty percent is going to be the center of the frequency band. Um, that is the cutoff frequency. The resonant is the peak that we see at the cutoff moment, right? This is called the resonant peak. And again, here we have a value between zero and one, uh, whether there's a peak or not. The uh, other important things, again, are the what, what type of filter it is, a low pass, LP, a band pass, a BP, or a high pass. And then these lush, I mean, remember all these crazy words that don't have a lot of meaning, but the 6 dB versus 12 versus 24 shows you the slope. So this is a 6 dB cutoff. It's a more gentle slope. A 12 dB is a steeper slope. And then the 24 dB is the, the steepest slope, meaning it cuts off quicker. It's more intense. Okay. Um, and then as we talked about, um, the amp envelope or the, what is it? No, not the envelope. Sorry. The intensity actually on this envelope um, is achieved actually with the ant, just the, the volume output, I believe. can't remember exactly. Uh, I don't remember, but there isn't actually, I don't think maybe a, yeah, there is no filter drive on here. So we have no way of boosting the signal here, which is what drive does, but it's very common on a lot of synths to see that. Okay, going on. So the filter types we just covered, right? Low pass, high pass, band pass. Um, and I, this is exactly what I just talked about, all these different parameters, right? Whether something's low pass, the cutoff frequency, then the slope, 16 or 24, 18, whatever. Um, and then I talked about the, the here's a, shows you the different types of slopes. The resonant peak, right, which is that peak right at the edge. And here is an alchemy. Here's the resonant peak you can see is a, is actually a slider that you just, or a knob you turn to add resonant peak to the sound. Filter drive. So this is what is not in in, in, um, in retro synth. But what it does is it basically increases the gain for a filter. This is a serum. But if I add plus 6 dB, you can see that the, the sound that's not being filtered out is actually getting boosted in gain. And that's what dry, filter driving does. Okay, so that's what the filter is. Um, it's really important, obviously, because filtering is a huge part of synthesizers. Okay, um, so let's go on now to talk about the amp envelope. This is incredibly important and definitely will be on your test. Um, and again, we have this acronym ADSR, right? And before we do that, let's talk about what the amp envelope is. The env amp envelope is the actual shape of the sound. Um, it's the shape of the sound as it leaves the volume, as it leaves the synthesizer, right? So if you think about most sounds either are short and quick or they're long and soft and lush. Um, those things are controlled by the amplitude envelope, which is of course the volume envelope. An envelope is any sort of like set of values that take place over time, okay? So if we for, talk about ADSR, the ADSR is an envelope type. The attack is the first one. It's the time it takes for a sound when it's triggered to reach full de decibels, right? The decay time is the time it takes for the triggered sound to reach its sustain level. Um, and this is also in milliseconds. These are both in milliseconds. The sustain um, level is actually a decibel level and it's set with sustain, okay? And then, and that is the volume that something is held at until it's released, okay? Then the last one is the release. And that's the time it takes for a triggered sound to return to zero dB when the note is released time of release, okay? So you can see here's our amp envelope. The time domain is from right to left. The volume level is the vertical. Um, and the attack time, again, is the time it takes from zero to whatever. The decay times, how long it takes to reach its normal level or its sustain level. The sustain level is a decibel level. And then the release time is how long it takes that sound to go to zero once it's the note is released, okay? So 
And let me show you just a good example of that in, in Logic. Because um, if we look here at RetroSynth, if I play here, right down here is my amp envelope, right? And right now if I play a note, it's fairly quick to react. And when I release the note, it goes away right away. It's gone. Okay, but look at what happens if I increase my release time to one second, which is a thousand milliseconds. You can hear it sustaining through, right? So similarly too, if I, if I increase my, lower my sustain level, listen to what happens. The note is going to be attacked, then the decay happens, and then it holds out on this level, which is actually at 0.3 of the main volume. Ready, here we go. So now it's settled at the sustain level until I release the note, okay? Similarly, if I add a bunch of attack time, this really changes the sound as well because it now makes the song the sound slower, right? Oops. So now we have a, a slow attack time, which gives it a lusher sound. I can make this even longer and also increase my release time. So this dramatically changes the sound. Then if I do something like this, I have zero attack time, essentially zero release time. Now my sound is basically instantaneously. And also I can do stuff like this too, which is common in a sound. I actually have no sustain level. So now my sound is only the time it takes for the volume to reach full volume and the decay time. So if I stretch this out, that was really long. Now I get kind of a plucked sound, right? Um, I can also put my decay time to zero and increase my release time. Oh, I can't do that actually. I thought I could. I guess I have to have some decay. Okay, anyway, so that is my ADSR, right? Really important uh, concept, attack, decay, sustain, and release. And if we go back to this slide, you can see the different, these are the parameters. Very often it looks like this, where I'm setting levels for each of these things. Um, this is ES1, this is ES2. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about here is modulation, and um, or one of the last things on here is modulation with synths. So the amp envelope, I, I talked about adding basically a fourth category and that was adding modulators inside here. The idea with modulators again was that they were used to alter the sound over time as it, as it sounded, okay? Modulation in synthesis means to change or control a parameter with the vector line like automation in real time. This can be done in many different forms but is most commonly done with an LFO or a modulation envelope, okay? So imagine I wanna have a filter that moves during the course of the sound. I can map that movement to a modulation envelope or I can map it to an LFO that kind of oscillates, okay? So modulation envelope, a second or multiple ADSRs that are used to map the motion of other parameters like cutoff filter. An LFO, again, stands for Low Frequency Oscillator. Man, that's a good question for your test. What is an LFO? Um, a wave oscillating below the audio rate, which is at 20 hertz, is used to map the motion of a parameter. So most commonly filters is a good example. So the mod envelope um, is a second or multiple ADSRs envelopes that are used to map motion of other parameters. So again, an ES1, or sorry, in RetroSynth, our mod envelope is right here. It's called the filter envelope, okay? And I can easily use that by, so right now here's my sound. Oh, let me give it some length here. Let's give it some length, give it some sustain. There we go. So I wanna now give it some LFO. So you can hear that I'm modulating the sound right now with an LFO that's filtering, so like basically a flutter in the sound, right? 
um, and that's how it's modulating back and forth. So it's a really useful tool for doing all kinds of modulation. The most common type of modulation is an LFO, which is some sort of wavy motion in the sound, okay? Um, I don't want to get too much into this, but you, uh, low frequency oscillator I just talked about. So this really matters. This is really important for your, your test, these last little bits here. Other common parameters in synthesizers. The first one, again, is whether or not the instrument can play more than one note at a time, okay? So, and that is the difference between monophonic and polyphonic. Obviously, mono means one, poly means many. So there will be a monophonic or polyphonic button. Also, the number of voices. This can sometimes determine, again, whether something's monophonic or polyphonic, but it can also determine the thickness of the sound, basically because the sound gets multiplied and added to more sounds. And then the last one here is glissando. And glissando is about whether or not the notes are instantly going to the next note or whether there's a, gl a gliss or what's called a, a ramp. So I go from one low sound to a high sound. Um, and I'll show you those in a second. So monophonic or polyphonic, we have some synthesizer autom automatically monophonic or polyphonic. Um, so, for instance, there's a monophonic synth in Logic that's called monophonic, and it means it only plays a note at one note at a time. Um, and, but most of them are flexible. Most of them you can do multiple things with. Number of voices I just talked about. Um, here are some examples of that. Here's ES2. You can see the monophonic and polyphonic settings. Here are the number of voices, and then the glide is right here. So let me show you, too, what glide does. So as you can hear... I can play one note to, and the next note. If I turn the glide on here and turn the time up, listen to what happens now when I play those two notes. So the sound is ramping, it's it's glissing, glissandoing to the next pitch, which is what glide is, all right? And in alchemy, the glide is controlled here, and here are the number of voices as well. Um, Here's ES1, where you can see the number of voices here and the glide right here in milliseconds. Um, the vocoder synth, which we didn't really talk about, in, in, but it's a logic synthesizer. You can choose monophonic, polyphonic, or legato, the number of voices. Okay? So, anyways, that covers this entire video, or this, in, no, sorry, this entire um, uh setup or the, what is it the slideshow about synthesizers okay um let's go on now and talk about the next one which is the common effects plugins okay so um these we covered briefly and again you know what matter i'm going to tell you what matters the most about all these i'm going to try and speed this up i'm already at 26 minutes so but again we're covering here the tremolo the bit crusher the directional mixer, the spreader, the chorus or ensemble effect, and the pitch shifter, okay? And um, I just want you to know the basics about how these work and what they do and, and their most important parameters, all right? So tremolo is a periodic oscillation of the decibels of a signal through the use of an LFO. So we use a low frequency oscillator that makes basically creates a pulsing sound of something sustained. So, right, and the most important factors here are the oscillation rate, which is usually set to tempo, and I do that with this button right here. The oscillation depth, which is how much, how intense the pulsing is. The smoothness, which is kind of the shape of the oscillation. The phase, which determines whether or not both speakers are oscillating together or separately. Okay, and that's that's all of the the, os, the tremolo. So let's take a look at that. If I if I include the tremolo, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead in here and go to audio effects, oscillate tremolo. So let's just cover those again. The rate is set to the tempo. Okay, um, and here is the button to set it to whether or not it's a um, within the tempo or whether it's based on just hertz. The depth is how much this happens. Is there a little bit of oscillation or a lot of oscillation? The smoothing changes the shape, right? And then the last thing is this phase. So if I set the phase to zero, both speakers will pulse together. Okay. If I separate them, you'll hear it oscillate left, right, left, right, left, right. 
-hmm. Okay. So that is, those are the basic parameters of tremolo. And remember, this is an oscillation of decibels of, of volume intensity. Okay. The bit crusher, the bit crusher is an audio effect created by changing the bit depth or bandwidth of an audio signal. All right. So, um, an audio signal most commonly has things like, um, um, well, it's usually set to 16 bit or 24 bit and the b bandwidth of the audio file is usually in Hertz, uh, 44,100 samples per second, uh, whatever. So, the most important parameters here again then are the drive. Well, it just tells you what it does. The drive is what the sound, how, how intense the sound is when it's overdriven. Basically, this is a, an effect of distortion. You can see that if this was a sine wave, it's being clipped off at the top, right? There's clipping. And that's a specific effect that we kind of actually really like. The resolution is setting the decibel resolution of the signal. You know, most commonly is 16 or 24 bits. So if you go down below that, it has this very specific sound, sounding like old computer games, right? Downsampling sets the, the sample rate up lower or higher. Most commonly we lower it so it sounds old school and kind of a lot rougher, okay? And then the last one is the mix. The mix is how much of the signal is being affected by the plugin. So if I have this at 50%, again, the sound will be half affected and half not, okay? So that's the bit crusher. It's basically a downsampling. Um, it's basically taking a signal and degrading it. Often we could talk about degrading. That's what this does, okay? The directional mixer. The directional mixer allows you to send both signals to whichever pan position you want. It also allows you to introduce spread to a signal. So the directional mixer, as we talked about traditional panning, if I have things in the center, both speakers are sounding. If, if I pan left, the right speaker is silent. That's why it actually goes to pan, right? It pans left because the right speaker is silent. If I pan right, the opposite happens. The left speaker goes silent. So um, in directional mixing, what happens is instead of doing that, I send, if I go to the left, it sends the right speaker to the left as well. And if I go to the right, it sends both speakers to the right side. So this can be useful, especially if sounds, if the two inputs speakers are really different, you might lose a lot of the signal if you pan left and all the right channel goes away, okay? So the most important parameters here, again, of course, are the direction, the spread, which is actually how much of the signal sounds like it's at the end, edges of the stereo field um, so you can make things sound like they're on the perimeter of the of the sound, which can be really useful actually for things like hi hats and some drum sounds. Um, anyways, that's it. I mean, this is a pretty simple plugin, but the idea is that you're just doing a different type of panning. Okay, the stereo spreader. Um, it's an effect that allows you to spread the stereo image out, and it gives a sense of a fuller, wider sound. All right. So um, and let's just go through these parameters the rate is which um, affects the sense of which the frequency are being spread out um, higher number means the frequencies are more present at the edges of the stereo field the intensity is how much of the stereo spread is being implemented so this can kind of add some pitch variations in your spread make it really kind of wobbly-ish channel delay is a short delay that can give a sense of stereo fullness and width it's almost like there is a delay and it, it kind of makes the image on top of itself, but just a tiny bit off. And so it's, it looks wider. And then as we know, mix is the amount of signal being affected by the plugin. Okay. The next one is chorus. Um, the chorus effect is a way of thickening a sound, right? So remember we talked about the, the fact that chorusing is when you cre create a sound and then you create multiple copies of that sound that are a little bit different from each other. So it sounds like um, many people singing because of course in a choir, no one can sing exactly the same. Everyone has a little bit different sound to them, their voice and e there's a little bit of detuning throughout and it creates this kind of rich, broader texture. And that's what the chorus is trying to recreate. Um, the rate of the chorus sets the amount of variation in the pitch right, which can be a lot or a little. Usually it's a little bit. You don't want a ton of variation in pitch because it'll start to sound detuned. The intensity is this, sets the amount um, 
mount what well, sets the amount that the rate affects the signal. So intensity is about how much this rate is affecting it. And then the last thing again is the mix. How much of the sound is actually being um, affected by the plugin? Okay. Um, the pitch shifter allows for the shifting of an original pitch up or down by sense or semitones. So, and I mentioned too that you know Logic's pitch shifter is not that great, honestly, um, but it does work. So the idea then is that we first have our semitone setting. So if I want to move this up by half steps, meaning the the notes on the piano, that's what semitones are. There are twelve in an octave. The sense, which is moving actually the fine tuning of a sound up quarter tones or down quarter tones. And then the last one is the mix. Um, and the mix, again, does the same thing. It sets how much of the signal is being affected. But it's important to remember, if you don't have the mix at 100%, you'll hear two notes at once, right? Because you're going to hear the original pitch plus the, the pitch shifted version, okay? All right, so that's it for these this uh, this set here. Um, there's only one more to cover, and it's the buses and sends. And what's funny about my buses and sends uh, PDF is it's not really a very well. There's not a lot of text on it. It's mostly just diagrams. But um, I'll cover. The okay, so I'm now going to cover this last um, group here, talking about buses and sends. And again, I think this is kind of maybe the most complicated or just hard to get your head around concept from this class. Um, so as we know, if you have a channel strip, the most common thing is that it, the, the, the channel or the track outputs out the main speakers, right? That's the way it's set up automatically. And every DAW, the DAW outputs to the main outputs, and then you hear it through the speakers. So that means if I put a reverb, for instance, on a channel, that sound gets reverbed, right? And um, that can be good, but imagine that if I, if I want to do, again, parallel processing versus serial. If I have a bunch of effects here and I put them in the serial, it affects the entire sound, right? Except that, again, a lot of synthesizers now have a mix button, right? So the mix knob allows me to mix certain amounts of reverb and less or more. So if we go back to alchemy here, if I put in a reverb, for example, we see we have wet now, wet and dry. And wet, if I do 50%, that means half of the sound is, is coming out, is being added to reverb. But also we have an 100% version of this coming out without any effects at all. Um, so that is common with a lot of effects, but not all of them. So if I wanted to use a bus, if I want to send the sound, if I want to use parallel processing, I can send the sound to another channel. And I do that with sends and buses. So the three things to the three terms to know here are the auxiliary channel, the send, and the bus. The auxiliary channel is the empty channel used for effects. So that is, in Logic, it's automatically created. The bus is automatically, when you choose a bus, an aux channel, an aux channel is generated in instantaneously with that input, and it's ready to go. In, in Pro Tools, you have to create the aux channel. Same thing in Ableton. Actually, in Ableton, if you create an aux channel, it automatically makes the bus. The send is the amount of the signal being sent to the aux channel. The bus is the channel that the gain is sent on. So the, again, the bus is a variable, bus 15, bus 20. It's a name, it's a number, it's, a, it's the, the actual lane that the bus is taking, okay? So what I use then is that if I create an aux channel, it also outputs through the stereo output. But if I take my, if I set my input to being bus one on my aux channel. And then I move my reverb over to the aux channel. And then I go to my sends in Logic, for instance. I can input, I can change this gain knob here to send some of my sound through this bus and then add reverb to it. So I'm getting the signal now out the output with no reverb, but I'm also sending some of it to bus one or aux one, aux channel one, through the bus lane one, 
and it's adding some reverb and then sending that to the output, okay? So this is really useful, of course, too, because then I can now have multiple channels. I could have three or four different channels if I wanted to that were all using bus one. And so I could have seven channels. Here I have two that are also sending to bus one and adding reverb. Okay, so the nice thing now is I could have 25 channels that are all getting some reverb through these buses. And it really is good on the CPU because then I'm not using, you know, I'm not using 25 reverbs. I'm using one reverb and just sending some sound to that one reverb. So that is the most, this is the way, the most common use of a bus. And it's called parallel processing, right? I'm sending some sound to another channel that then has an effect on it and then outputting that effect separately from the main output, right? So, but if we, there's another use for buses and it's to basically consolidate tracks together onto a new channel strip before it outputs. So this is the most common arrangement, right? I have a bunch of channels, they all send to the stereo output. But what if I, I sent those instead to a bus, like bus one here, and I outputted that to the stereo instead, right? So what's happening now is that all of my sounds are being intercepted by this aux. And if I, for instance, put a reverb on it, then they would all get reverb, right? And then go to the stereo output. Um, or if I put an effect on, or if I just wanted to change the gain. So imagine a really good scenario here is that these are my drums. All of my drums are on these tracks. 15 tracks of drums. They're all playing at once. But now I have a bus that can actually be the single slider for all those drums because it's separate and everything's consolidated on that bus first. Okay. So really useful thing, buses and sends and aux channels. Um, and let me just show you how those, those how those look in Logic. So if I'm in Logic, again, the most common setup is this, right? Right now I have an instrument playing and it's outputting throughout the stereo output right here. If I wanted to add an effect to it, I could go to sends here, choose a bus. And again, this is totally arbitrary. I'm going to choose bus 10. And nicely in Logic, the channel over here instantly becomes that bus because I've selected a bus. And this actually, this channel is changeable because watch, if I click on the stereo output, it actually switches back to stereo output. If I click here again, it goes back to the bus. So I'm gonna put effect on here. Let's choose um, something um, obvious, like the ring shifter stereo. Okay, let me close that. So now, not only is the sound going out this output, but watch the level here as I add some bus in. So I'm sending now the sound over to this channel as well. And I'm hearing the ring shifter added to that sound, as opposed to this. If I want, if I if I added the ring shifter here, listen to what happens. This is parallel processing. So you can hear the difference. the The entire sound is getting ring shifted right now. But if I move it over here, I hear some sound without ring shifting, and then some sound with. And I can increase the amount here. If I go to zero, that means the entire signal is going to go to the ring shifter. Anyway, so that is, again, this is parallel processing. Now I have two channels playing the ring shifter at the same time. One has an effect and one only has the reverb, right? So the other, again, possibility is this, that the output instead is a bus. Right, so I can choose bus 20. Now my actual output, the stereo, the channel is no longer outputting out the mains. It's actually being bypassed and going through a bus first. Okay, and I could call the distance all drums and then actually send the sound, send all my drum tracks there, right? And then I can hear them collectively and I can also control all the drums with a single slider. I can also add certain effects to all the drums if I wanted to. Maybe I wanted to downsample or something 
um, at a specific moment, do something cool to all the drums. I don't have to do them separately because they're on a bus. Okay. All right, you guys. So that is it for me, my tutorials um, for this class. And that is it for your, your final exam review. I will put together a test that covers all these things. And as I said, please look at the first part of this because you'll get all the information you need to know about the test, which starts on Monday at 8 a.m. Um, and if you have any questions,